I'm going to try in today's class to finish up the section on what I think of as boulder number two on the way of the little people on their glorious journey to the shimmering, shining, silvery land of phenomenology. Um, I have more stories to tell you. I wasn't sure which one to go first with, so I just put them up in the order that I have. I'm going to follow regardless. Um, the sub-theme right now in the critique of the medical model, which is the bolder, the diagnosticians, the psychiatrists, and so on, is the impact of learning one's diagnosis on the patient. What is the experience the patient has when he or she is told they're suffering from this or that mental illness? Okay? And I gave you a couple of examples of that uh, already. One guy who killed himself when he found out who it was, because then he was the same as his father, he had to be dead to be like that. And another one, Patty Duke, who was overjoyed because it meant she wasn't the devil. She just suffered from an illness. These are the subjective effects. But what can study the subjective effects of diagnosis without taking a position on whether there's anything to the idea, for example, of bipolar disorder or manic depressive illness as an actual biological condition caused by brain chemistry? It may or may not be caused by what someday will be identified as brain chemical processes or neurochemical disorders or something. Who knows? So far, it has not been nailed down. I can tell you that. But even if it is or isn't, one can still think about what does it do to the patient to be told that's what they're suffering from. It's complicated. And, and there need to be careful studies of what, it's, what it feels like to be diagnosed. By the way, I was once diagnosed. I had my own little introduction to this when I first came to Rutgers. I wasn't going to talk about this, but I might as well. Uh, when I first came to Rutgers in 1971, to give a colloquium and be considered to be hired, department, assistant professor, and all this, the person who was then chair, chairperson, chairman of the clinical psychology program was a Skinnerian behaviorist, by the way, doing research on, uh, he would take drunks from the New Brunswick jail and put them in a big warehouse and, and give alcohol as a reinforcer and do offering conditioning on them using alcohol rewards, rewards for them. That was his research. I wasn't real fond of that, or Skinnerian behaviorism, as you know. Anyway, um, I had an interview with him while I was here, uh, visiting, and uh, he asked me about my background, and I said I had deep, extensive, rich training in behavioral, behavioral psychology, which I had. I had suffered with it all the way to undergraduate and graduate school, so I knew all about it. But I disliked it. And I told him I had, the more I learned about it, the less I liked it, and I really gravitated much more to a Freudian, Jungian, phenomenological, I didn't use that word at the time, point of view. He said, well, George, my history is exactly the opposite. I started out with an interest in Freud and Jung, and then I saw that they were, with, they did not have a scientific foundation, and I moved to behaviorism. He began to hate me at that point. I was like the devil to him, the complete opposite of him. And then I found out later that uh, he had gone to a faculty meeting in which it was discussed whether to uh, give a job offer to George E. Atwood IV, 26 years old, so I was at the time. And he had stood up and, and, and argued vehemently that it would be a danger to the department to hire me onto, into the faculty. Why? Because I was a clear-cut, latent schizophrenic. I am the proud owner of the diagnosis schizophrenia, courtesy of the chairman of the Department of the Clinical Program here at Rutgers at that time. He's, thank God, long gone now. Um, it might be worth you knowing this. He was an active participant in the creation of DSM-3. In other words, he was on the committees and went to the meetings and, and engaged in the deliberations with psychiatrists. They also include psychologists in the, in the creating of that. So he's, he's a real, he's a, he's a man on hooks guy. Okay? He's hanging there without a doubt. And he pronounced me latent schizophrenia. What is latent schizophrenia? Well, you won't find it in the DSM-4. It was in the DSM-2 at the time. I was familiar with the idea of this. It's the notion that some people give a semblance of normality in their functioning, 
but actually they're crazy as a loon underneath. Late, but it's latent rather than manifest. But what can happen with a so-called latent schizophrenic is their buttons get pushed and kablooey! Delusions, hallucinations, chaos. You want to really hire somebody out of your faculty who's going to go kablooey in front of the students? He argued it would be a bad mistake and I shouldn't be hired. It comes back to you. You know, people say these horrible things about you. It comes back to you with a grapevine. It freaked me out. It really pissed me off, too. I feel like it was like a horrible thing to do. It's, it's not really accurate. If, if, if you're going to take George Atwood and put him up against the DSM <coughs> category systems, using those systems, I'm, I'm sort of like a bad depressive. Not, I don't really fit the schizophrenia. I don't have the four A's of schizophrenia, latent or manifest. I do have a vulnerability to depression. I've had some terrible depressions in my life. Fortunately, for the last 25 years, nothing. I hope never to get depressed again. But that, that's where I fit. So it's a completely wrong diagnosis. But also, it's the use of, it's the use of medical pathologizing thinking to, to advance a political kind of ideological purpose to maintain the purity of the behaviorist point of view here. Because I was obviously going to be a thorn in his side. And so it turned out that I could not be hired onto the clinical faculty at Rutgers. I had to be hired onto the general experimental personality faculty instead, just as well. But it set up a it set up a, a, a situation where I've never really been able to participate in the clinical program at Rutgers because the dominant thinking there was behaviorist. Eventually, it turned into CBT. They want nothing to do with me. I want nothing to do with them. It's worked out better though that way. So anyway, it feels weird to be called schizophrenic. You know, like oh my God, it freaks you out. You know, what if he's right? What if the guy knows what he's talking about? And I really am crazy. We just don't know it. Okay, but. It, it occurs to me that um, I had a lot of knowledge about myself, about the diagnostic system, that I could use to fend that diagnosis off and sort of say, well, he's full of shit, he's an asshole, and he's just making this up to prove his behaviorist point and support the people he wants to support. So it helped me to have that argument. Plus, I have friends that I talked to about it. They were outraged on my behalf, and they validated my experience of this being a stupid, unjustified and outrageous thing for him to do. So I had all this support around me. And even so, it was very, very upsetting. But it didn't undermine me completely. However, if you have someone who really is in the middle of complete personal catastrophe, the bottom falls out of their universe, and you tell them they are latent or otherwise schizophrenic, what resources do they have to fall back on? They have no knowledge about anything. They haven't studied psychiatry. Maybe they've never had any therapy. They don't even know what, how to understand themselves. A person, a doctor, a fancy doctor, PhD or MD, gives them this diagnosis. That's, a, that's an enormous uh, figure of authority. And this person comes down with this horrible thing. What's it going to do to that person? I have a story about this. Um, this is, I'm, I'm going to try to make a long story as short as I can. Um, I have to work myself back into the, my time traveling mode now and return to some scenes that I lived through <coughs> back in the early 1970s. Maybe about 1974. I'd only been here a few years, a couple of years practicing teaching. And I gave a guest seminar uh, presentation one evening for, as a favor to another faculty member. And the topic I chose to speak on was um, like identi identity and identity crisis, basically. That was it. And I used some examples from so-called schizophrenic patients who, one way of describing them is in the most clear that they are in the most profound identity crisis one can possibly have, the obliteration of one's sense of personal identity. Anyway, I talked about that, told a few case stories and stuff in the class. And I, I remember a woman came up to me after class was over a uh, big, heavy-set woman, quite heavy, with long hair, kind of, she was, she was white, but it's kind of Afro-like sticking out all over the place, and a big, colorful T-shirt with a Grateful Dead across the front. And she was smiling, and she said, I loved your talk, George. You're just great seeing you. Glad to meet you. My name is Marie. I made, made that name up, but that's it, okay. So I remembered her, because she was so striking-looking and so friendly, and I was very friendly back to her. I said, I'm glad you liked to see you around. Six months later, I get a call from her. She said, do you remember me from your class? I said, yes. She had 
gone completely kablooey. The bottom had fallen out in, in, in the weeks or a month after I had seen her, not because of anything that happened in my class. And she had been hospitalized for several months at the, what was then called the Rutgers Community Mental Health Center, UMDNJ now, um, in the inpatient unit. And she, she had just been discharged and wanted an outpatient therapist. And she asked me if I possibly would be willing to see her. And I said, sure, I would be glad to. Let's have a meeting. And I want to tell you the story she told me the first night I met her. So she came to see me and uh, Marie. And I said, well, tell me all about whatever it is. Now, this, a lot of the details don't matter too much, but I'll just throw a few in for the mix. Don't write all this down. Just flow with the story. Um, she was 21 or 22 at this time, maybe a sophomore in college with credit. She never managed to finish her college education, ever really, but she had gone a certain distance. And uh, she had had three major psychotic episodes. Three times the bottom had fallen out. Each in, the, in each of these, she began to hallucinate, became completely disorganized, developed all kind of paranoid delusions, and uh, she would be hospitalized for various periods. One was lasted about three weeks, another lasted a month and a half, and this last one had lasted three or four months in the hospital before they finally let her out. Um, much later, I worked with her for 25, 30 years. Much later, she told me about this period. These were the only psychotic episodes she ever had. But she told me much later, she said, you know, you're just a different type of person once you go through something like that. And I said, well, tell me, what is that difference? She said, it's kind of like you're walking on a road. Most people just walk on a highway or on a road, a pathway. They go and go and go, and they go, you know, this year and next year and this decade and that one. And the road is, maybe it has some bumps and turns and you trip now and then or whatever. But what it's like for someone like her is that three nuclear blasts happened along that road, leaving, leaving immense craters. She said, you're just a different type of person once you've been through that. I think that's right. The phenomenology of the post-psychotic person, you, you have a very different world when your mind has been blown and blown repeatedly over and over again. Even though you might be together at the moment, you don't ever go back to that kind of naive state that doesn't know about the possibility of mind-blowing experiences, <coughs> utter psychological catastrophe. Anyway, that's not the heart of the matter, though. So uh, I sat down with her that first night when she came, and. Um, she told me the following story of what had just happened to her in the hospital. She said, you know, uh, I'm, a, I'm a schizophrenic. I said, I, I said, well, I'm not much for the diagnostic system, but tell me what you're talking about anyway. She told the following, the following. Let's see if I can paraphrase her, her words, but stay close to her language as she spoke it to me. And that's why I'm thinking back on it, putting myself. It's, it's evening, it's 7 o'clock in the evening. It's dark outside. I'm looking out the window, and there she is, Marie. Hi, Marie, how you doing? I'm going to tell you, George, about schizophrenia. <coughs> um, she had been hospitalized this third time, was very disorganized. Uh, her, her mind was just associating in a thousand different directions. She had many different delusions. She thought that there was a revolution taking place in America. People were hiding in the mountains. They were going to come down and overthrow the government. That was one whole set of delusions. Another delusion she had was that she thought God had selected her to have sexual intercourse with the entire male half of the human race. I'm not going to go into the meaning and significance of that with you now anyway. Maybe we'll touch that in a later lecture or something. We can do that. But it was like that. She heard voices. She, she, she see, Whenever she saw numbers on little sheets or license plate numbers, she'd think it was coded messages for this and for that. So that was part of her so-called psychosis. And uh, she was lost in her own autistic world. That would be one of the A's of schizophrenia. And they had diagnosed her. Uh, I don't know if it was acute or chronic schizophrenia, but anyway, the schizophrenia was the diagnosis they had given her. But they didn't tell her that. She was put on antipsychotic medications, uh, phenothiazines, thorazine, stelazine being the main two on prolixin. Um, those aren't used much now. We have newer drugs, not really more effective than those. The studies show they aren't any more effective than the old ones, but there's been a change of preferred drugs for the most part. Um, so what else? She wasn't improving 
very quickly in the hospital. And part of the problem from the standpoint of the medical staff was she was resisting the medication they were giving her. She's telling me this story now. Thorazine was the main tranquilizer they had put her on. And one of the effects of Thorazine is to create what is called photosensitivity, sensitivity to light. And if you have a heavy dose of Thorazine, you can't sit in the sunlight for more than 15 or 20 minutes or you get deep, blistering burns. But the one thing that made her feel good while she was in the hospital was, bath was sunbathing. She wanted to go outside and sit in the sunlight in a lawn chair or something like that and soak up the rays, and it calmed her down. But she'd get these horrible burns from it. So she began to spit <coughs> the uh, Thorazine out, like so many of the patients do. You know, the med medication time, all the patients line up at the nurse's station, go and get their pills, put in their mouths. She would put it in her mouth as if she swallowed it, then go to the bathroom, <coughs> Spit it out, okay? That's what patients do, they spit it out. Well, one of the nurses walked in on her, she was spitting out her, her, her medication. And this is after she's already been in the hospital for two months or something. And this was an acute treatment center. They didn't like to keep people more than 10 days. Here she was, eight weeks already. And so the doctors were getting very uh, antsy about how long she was uh, going on and not improving because the delusions and hallucinations were still there. And um, the nurse now reported to her doctor, a psychiatrist, that uh, she was throat spitting out the medication, not cooperating with the plan. So the doctor <coughs> called her in for a special meeting. They were building up to her having her diagnosis presented to her. Um, she went and sat to her doctor, who was a resident from Pakistan, and who meant well, but who was operating within the medical model. And the doctor said, Marie, I called you in because I have some important things I want to talk to you about. And she said, yes, doctor. She was able to have somewhat of a conversation, not just be a Looney Tunes all over the place. She would concentrate for a few minutes. And the doctor said the following, Marie, this is very important that you hear me. You are a schizophrenic. Do you know what that means? And Marie didn't know for sure exactly what that meant. She had certainly heard the term. She probably had the customary view that it means split personality, which is not what it means. Split personality, like Sybil or Eve or something, that's a whole different ball of wax than so-called schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a psychosis. It's the most severe mental illness there is, characterized by delusions, hallucinations, the four A's, like I was telling you all that. Uh, so the doctor said, you're a schizophrenic. Do you know what that means? And Marie said, well, I'm not exactly sure is it split something, a personality maybe. The doctor said, let me tell you what it is exactly. Schizophrenia is a brain disease. It's a neurochemical disorder. It's something <coughs> wrong. It's a defect in the functioning in the metabolism of your brain. And genetic predispositions inherited in your family play an important role in this. It runs in families. And um, Schizophrenia is a disease that is treatable by medication, but you, Marie, will need to be on medications for the rest of your life. And I understand you have been resisting the medication and spitting them in the toilet. This is not cooperating with the treatment program that we've designed for your illness. Am I making myself clear? Well, let me say one more thing, Marie. And Marie was listening to all this, was absorbing it, absorbing it, absorbing it, not really processing it, but taking in the words. The doctor said, if you do not cooperate with the program, and that means the medication as well as the activities that we have designed for you, uh, I'm going to send you to the state hosp mental hospital for long-term psych psychiatric care. Have I made myself clear? Yes, doctor, she said. Okay. So she's telling me this story. And so what I'm saying is we need to think about what it might feel like to be talked to that way. And it's one thing to be George Atwood, who was pretty intact, more or less, and got lots of friends and lots of knowledge to help him deal with being told he's schizophrenic. But it's another thing to be Marie, where her whole world is just shattered and fallen to atoms. And she barely knows even who she is, and she's suddenly told this. And I said, well, what happened to you, Marie, after, after you walked out of there? And she told me the following. She said, the words that had been spoken kept running through her mind and running through her mind. She kept hearing, Brain disease, brain disease, brain disease. Then she heard neurological defect, neurological defect, metabolic illness, metabolic disorder, genetics, genetics, genetic predisposition, medications for life, medication. These are the phrasings of the doctor. Those words kept circling and circling through her thoughts. And then she began to have an experience that is 
that almost defies our ability to find words for what it might be. Um, and she had a hard time expressing it to me, but I caught on to what it was because I know about this sort of thing. She began to feel herself turning into what she had been defined as being by the doctor. In other words, it wasn't just that somebody said she had a defect in her brain. She kept thinking about this defect and defect and trying to picture it. And suddenly the feeling of what was left of Marina's, of her own identity, of who, of who she familiarly considered herself to be began to slip away and slip away. And all that was left was this inert defect, this disorder, this disease, these genetic predispositions. And she felt she was undergoing a conversion into the object her doctor had said was her problem and was her disease. And the word for this in, in Lyons' vocabulary is petrification. And I think she was undergoing an annihilation experience in the form of turning into an inert thing that someone else had described her as being. It involved a complete slipping away of what little was left of her identity to start with. So I, t I said, well, Ray, my God, it must have been horrible for you. She said, it was. And I said, what did you do? What did you do? She said, well, I somehow, uh, somehow or other began to pull myself together. And the word in particular, schizophrenic, schizophrenic, kept going running through her mind and running through her mind. I'm a schizophrenic. I've got a defect. I've got these, these dispositions, and I've got these disorders, and these metabolic deficiencies. <laughs> like, that's all, that's all she was. But she's fighting it, because it was a horrible, horrible feeling. And she wanted to get out of this awful feeling and didn't know what to do. She decided she would go study schizophrenia in the library. She somehow pulled herself together sufficiently to go to the hospital library, and she pulled down massive textbooks of psychiatry and looked up the chapters on schizophrenia in them. She read all about the symptoms and signs, but she wasn't able to relate to what she was reading about. She didn't recognize herself. She's looking for something to help her come back to herself. She looked into the history of the term. She went back to uh, the Swiss psychiatrist Bloiler, who coined the term in the first place in 1911 in a book called Dementia Precox, or The Group of Schizophrenias. She read some passages from that. She read about the four A's of schizophrenia. She couldn't relate to any of that. Couldn't find herself there. So then, and she's telling me this, and I'm just sitting there in that evening, 7 o'clock at night or 8 o'clock at night, hearing this story. And she went on to say, then I looked into the etymology. I said, you mean like the history of the word and the origin derivation? She said, yes. It comes from Greek. And the two roots of it are schizines, S-C-H, I-Z-E-I-N, and phrenos, P-H-R-E-N-O-S. And, and what Bloiler did is combine these two words to coin a new one, schizophrenia. And schizine means split or splitting. And phrenos means mind or heart, something like that in ancient Greek. So uh, that, that was the, uh, I don't know if it's ancient Greek, in, in, just in Greek, okay? So uh, she's looking at that. And then a sparkle came in Marie's eyes. As I'm sitting there with her, I said, what, what, is, what is that sparkle about in your eyes? She said, I suddenly found what I was looking for. I said, well, what, what did you find and what were you looking for? Something to help me connect with what it meant to be schizophrenic. And I said, well, tell me, what is it? She said, I found a new translation from the original Greek that I could live with better and I could relate to. I said, what was that translation? Instead of split mind, she said, you could translate the roots, the etymological linguistic roots of the term without violence to the language at all, the definitions, as torn soul rather than split mind or split heart. Okay? I said, well, why did that help you, torn soul? Why did, why did the phrasing of torn soul make sense to you? She said, because as long as I can remember, George, I, I'm a person who has felt she is in pieces rather than whole. And I said, what do you mean you're in pieces? What are you talking about? And she went on then to explain to me a characteristic feature of her self-experience that had been true for years and years and years. Uh, and what was it? That she wasn't, she said, I'm not one person. I'm not, I, have, I don't have one self. I have many different selves. I said, tell me about them. What are they, these selves? She said, well, there's my, uh, there's my social, my friendly social self. I'm a very friendly person. I'm sensitive. I can get along with other people. Everybody likes me. I'm the, I'm the life of the party. Uh, I have friends, oodles of friends everywhere. That's my social self. I said, yeah. And what else? She said, well, there's my religious self. I said, tell me about your religious self. She had been raised uh, in a Jewish household, but she had reached out to Hinduism and Buddhism and other 
other aspects of Eastern religion and kind of fashioned her own special mix of a very mystical re religious thinking. And she meditated a lot and believed in reincarnation and believed it was possible to levitate and was working on le levitating herself if she could eventually and, and following some kind of a pathway toward an enlightenment, satori, nirvana, something like that, okay? I said, yeah, what else? She said, well, there's my sexual self. I said, tell me about your sexual self. She says, I love sex. My sexual experiences have ranged from wonderful to transcendental. Never had a bad one. Mm. She was uh, somewhat bisexual, but preferred men. She had tons. She wasn't really terribly promiscuous, but she'd had upwards of 50, 60, 80 sexual partners and enjoyed them all thoroughly. Um, she had multi multiple orgasms every time she'd have, she'd have sex and immediately start having orgasms right away. You know, just tremendous, just fantastic. I said, well, okay, what else? Well, there's my comical humorous self. I said, tell me about that. She says, I tell jokes that are so funny that people, can't, people almost have heart attacks. They're laughing so hard they fall down. I found that to be true. She didn't tell me the jokes then, but I, I knew her for 30 years. And she did tell jokes later, and I was one of those guys on the floor laughing so hard. She was hilarious how funny she could be. I said, then there's, there, then there's my professional self. What is your professional self? She said, if I make a commitment to do something, like a, if I take on a job, an assignment from somebody, I move heaven and earth to see that it's done. I'm the best worker you have ever met. It was true. She was like that. She couldn't do much when she's psychotic, but when she was intact, she was the most faithful, reliable person you've ever seen in your life. And there might have been one or two more selves. I forget what the other ones were. But she had list, she listed a bunch of them, five, six, or seven. And I said, okay, but what, so what about it all? She said, well, there's only one problem. Each one of these is like a separate island. It's like a floating thing that isn't, doesn't connect to a common center. There's no land bridges to connect the islands together. They just kind of float about. First I'm one, then the other, then the other, then the other. So what she was describing was a kind of immediate but also chronic feeling of being in pieces. Being in, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sense of personal fragmentation. This is not multiple personality, by the way. Multiple personality or dual personality, a dissociative identity disorder is what they call it now in the new DSM for some whacked out reason. They decided that was better than multiple personality. It's not. <laughs> what happens in that is that a person has a series of different sort of alternate identities or selves, and they come and go and alternate with each other. They're called alters because they alternate with each other. And when one is present, the others are generally absent. And they come and go. So there isn't a feeling of fragmentation because you're just the one right now. You're Sybil, or you're Vanessa, or you're Vicky, if you're taking those the names out of Sybil's various personalities. You see, Marie was all of herselves always. But it was just a feeling that they were pieces. So it's a feeling of fragmentation. It's, it's, you, it's a little bit hard for our empathy because like, I don't experience myself as fragmented. I know I have different sides to me. There's a child side, a very grown up side, a depressed side, a paranoid side. I've got all these different sides. But they're like facets of one person to me and how I experience it. She wasn't like that. These are not facets of herself. These are pieces. As if, and she used these words, as if someone long ago cut me and up into pieces. That's what it was. Torn, see, Torn Soul, it helped her tremendously to find the new translation of schizophrenia, Torn Soul, because it restored the word to a connection to something that was a familiar part of her personal universe and her personal regard for herself. I was blown away by this. I think this story is beautiful. It's so amazing that she would find this unique creative translation and then be able to link it up to a feeling of being in pieces and actually it helped her overcome the petrification experience she was having at the hands of the doctor, who was trying to get her to just fly right and take do her treatments, right? But inadvertently annihilated her, or almost annihilated her, by the intrusive imposition of these definitions and these, these theories, not presented as theories, presented as facts. By the way, this doctor, this doctor added to the whole thing he said. She says, schizophrenia is very similar to diabetes. You've heard of diabetes, right? You know that diabetic patients have to take insulin shots because they have a defect and a deficiency in their metabolism. They don't synthesize their own insulin, so you have to have that. You're the same as that. The things that you can't create are compensated for by the medication, so I made myself clear. Now, that's all bogus science, by the way. Schizophrenia is not like diabetes. There's no scientific proof that that's true. But that kind of an idea became current, and this little speech that she heard from the doctor 
I have heard given to many other patients. I've heard many people say that's exactly what they were told. The self-assurance with which such statements are made does not match up with the science to support it. I'm just telling you guys that. Okay. So uh, what happened to Marie? Just to finish the story in a long, nice way. Her doctor said she'd have to be on medication the rest of her life. And she's, so she started taking her Thorazine and Stelazine and Artane, which takes care of the side effects of the Thorazine and Stelazine. And she did pull it together sufficiently to come out of the hospital. However, shortly thereafter, she started having uncontrollable chewing and chomping and clenching of her, clenching of her jaw and twitching and weird ticks and all this, and it was tired of dyskinesia. Maybe you don't know what that is. But that's, that's, those, those are symptoms of the brain damage produced by psychiatric drugs. The brain damage which can be permanent and leave you disfigured in the form of leaving you with permanent <coughs> ticks and grimaces that you can't control the rest of your life. So Marie was taken off of the, anti, the major antipsychotic medications and given a small prescription of Librium, which is a minor tranquilizer, usually just for anxiety, you have that. And it helped her a lot. And so after about six months of the Librium, she graduated to what became her permanent medication over the next 30 years, marijuana. I've never seen anybody smoke as much dope as this woman. <laughs> she smoked all, not all day, every day, but every day. She was stoned every single day. She had a reliable guy that she bought it for, real, real cheap. She got real, she got, had terrible financial problems and for a while, went into the business of selling it herself. And, Kept, kept herself together and maintained her life with her children. I was really worried because all illegal and she gets caught, she's going to jail. And I was real worried about that, but what are you going to do? She was not to be stopped. And looking back on the course of her life over that 30 years, I see the marijuana was a, a tremendous help to her. It soothed her every day, calmed her down. And I don't know if it protected her from a recurrence of her psychosis, but she managed to get through 30 years with no more psychotic breaks contrary to what the doctor had told her was going to happen to her. Because you're like a diabetic. You can't function without the medication. You're going to go kablooey again if you do it. Well, it's not, it's not always true. It wasn't true in her case. Okay? I worked with her twice a week for 30 years. She latched on to me, and I became her angel. I didn't have to do anything but just sit with her. I, didn't, I hardly ever said anything. I just listened sympathetically. I was very validating and supportive. And I, I became a kind of calm center in the storm of her wacky life, and she got married and had marital problems, and her husband had psychotic breaks. That was a problem. She, but she raised two children, was a beautiful mother. I know both children really well. They were totally intact, did not inherit anything from anybody. They were well taken care of, and they came together beautifully. And so I'm not going to give you the whole journey of her life. I'll just say, it wasn't that interesting. It just was, it was a life, like yours or mine, with a lot of marijuana, <laughs> obviously. And uh, finally, she had a heart attack and died at age 58. It was very sad, but she died of natural causes, and I went to her funeral. And I still have the, uh, her, her sister and her friends put together a, a special disc of her favorite rock music. And the Grateful Dead figured prominently on that disc, and I, I still sometimes listen to it. This is now 10 years ago, though. So it's kind of sad, the ending. But her life wasn't sad. It was very successful and good. But the point of the story is what? Just what I said. It's, 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 a, it's another dramatic story that shows you gotta, You should think about what it does to someone to be told they're suffering from this or from that, this disease or that one. What is it going to mean to that person? But if you're a medical model, you're not going to think about it because you're just thinking they've got a disease inside them. You're not thinking about what it feels like to talk to you about this so-called supposed disease. And whether or not they have a disease inside them, you could still do damage by talking about it in, in such an intrusive uh, way as her doctor was doing, okay? So let's see if I left anything else that I wanted to tell you there. No, that, that's about it on that story. Uh, I feel our, our field needs to become sensitive, sensitized. <laughs> the therapist needs to know what he's seeing from his, pa his or her patient. He's a part of the field affecting the patient and contributing to what you're seeing. But if your medical model, what you see is something emanating from inside that person, that's because you're looking at the, the pattern of defect, the pattern of um, departure from the ideal again, okay? Now, uh, I want to talk about another person, a, fam a very famous author, Kay Jameson. This, the story I have to tell you about her is not specifically um, 
it's, it's indirectly related to the theme of the impact of being diagnosed by someone. It, it involves that as a feature of it, but it's not the main, main thing. It's about manic depressive illness or bipolar disorder. Let me just talk for a little bit about Kay Jamison herself. She's the author of a book which is kind of a classic of the literature of madness. Unquiet Mind is the name of it. It's a quite good book from the standpoint of unveiling the personal phenomenology of so-called a bipolar disorder or manic depressive illness. She tells the story of her life. She, she's a classic case of this, if you want to look at it in a diagnostic sort of way. She also is a psych PhD in psychology, not psychiatry. She's not a psychiatrist. But she's a doctor of psychology. And uh, she's made the study of bipolar disorder, manic depressive illness, the theme of her life work. And another book that's kind of interesting is called, uh, I've got it written up there, uh, Touched by Fire. And it's what, is, what it is is a study of the, of, of, of the frequent correlation through history of creative genius and manic depressive illness. In other words, a lot of the great artists of the past and writers and thinkers, the, the people that we look up to is really incredible uh, creative spirits also fit the criteria of manic depressive illness. So she records that and writes about that. It's kind, it's kind of interesting, kind of good to know how frequent the correlation is there. And it makes you wonder, well, why would that be? Well, what would have caused that? Madness and genius seem to go together sometimes, often. And that's a great theme I love to think about and talk about. Um, Kay Jamison herself is not a genius, though. And there are many problems with, with her thinking if you want to just critically evaluate it. I, I don't want to dwell on that right now. But what about Kay herself? Um, the book, uh, Unquiet Mind, tells the story of her life history and her childhood. And uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to summarize it all. I'm going to just give you my kind of summary impressions of what I see there. Her childhood, she might have been, in the, she has a sister, so there are two children in the family. I, I think, I can't remember, it was a younger or older sister. But uh, the family was a military, father was a colonel or something in the Air Force, and it was a military family moving from base to base through her early years. And the hallmark of the family was iron control by a dominating mother. That's, that's what I see. Kay Jamison, when she writes about her background and her mother does not describe her in those terms. But I read between the lines of what she's describing, and I see a mother who was irres an irresistible, oppressive authority. And there's some signs of attempted rebellion, but the, these, these attempted rebellions are crushed by the mother. And, and the main thing that unfolds there is a life of compliant surrender to the mother and to the father and to the demands of being part of a military family where the family had to go around and go to balls and meet lots of other important officials in the military and play certain roles that were part of, uh, just part of what life was like there. That's Kay Jamison's background. Um, she grew up, and by the time she reached maybe 23, 24, I think she might have had a PhD in psychology, 25 years old, she started having mood swings, violent mood swings. And they quickly got completely out of control. And she was she, she began to show like extremes of euphoria and racing thoughts and <coughs> cockamamie ideas and hypersexuality and the whole thing, and then crash into devastating suicidal depressions, back and forth and back and forth. And uh, eventually got into the hands of some psychiatrists who tried to get her to take medications to stabilize her moods and render her more functional. She fought like hell against them. Uh, for even years, like wouldn't take the medication or she'd take it and stop it and so on before she finally caved in and was willing to really do what they asked her to do. And then once that began to happen, her, moods did, her mood swings did uh, even out a little bit better. And I thought I would tell you a story about a, a period when she was just on the threshold of surrendering and complying with her psychiatrists to take the medication because it's just remarkable. 
And I don't know what you'll think of this story, but it's, it involves a delusion that she developed coinciding with the surrender to take the medication <coughs> that is a kind of parallel to Patty Duke's delusion that infiltrators were in the White House taking over the control of American policy. That's what I think. <coughs> so again, to make a long story short, after much back and forth, much rebellion and argument, Kay finally said, okay, I'll take the medication. She'd almost lost her life in the suicidal depressions and wrecked everything in the, in the extremes of her mania that she'd gone back and forth with. And so she went to the drug to the drugstore with her uh, little slip for her lithium carbonate is probably what it was. That's one of the main drugs you give to control mania in particular. And uh, she, she looked at the, she, she, she talked to the druggist, gave him a slip, and then looked around the store and found snake bite kits and felt suddenly a compelling need to purchase every snake bite kit they had. And they had like 35 or something, so she picked up all 35 snake bite kits and carried them back to the, to the, to the, to the druggist and bought them all. And why was she doing that? Well, she explains it in her book. She said that it just came to her as she was standing there Filling her prescription, which was an expression of having surrendered to the medical authority of her psychiatrist at that point, it came to her that poisonous snakes by the hundreds of thousands were coming down from a northern, she was in Los Angeles, coming down the San, San Fernando, Fernando Valley, coming down from northern parts of California and advancing on the LA area, and that they were going to bite and poison vast numbers of people, including her, her friends, her family. She was buying all these snake bite kits so that they, people would have the medical treatment available to fend off the poison these snakes were, were destined to inject into them. Are you guys following me? So, you know, what, do you, what does one make of a thing like that? Well, you could say, well, it's a delusion. It's kind of a paranoid delusion. The snakes are going to persecute you and so on. You could classify it, and maybe that sometimes manic depressive illness sometimes involves delusional thinking. You could say that. But phenomenologically, it means something. I think the snakes with their poison injected is a, is a specific concrete symbol of the authoritative agenda of her medical doctors, which she was now taking into and making a part of herself by conforming to their demand that she take medicine. I'm not saying she shouldn't have done that. I'm just saying she did do it. And then in the process of surrendering to them, letting their thinking become a part of her, she suddenly develops a delusion these poisonous creatures are going to come and put their poison inside of us all. See, it's the same thing as the infiltrating snakes. I mean, the infiltrating uh, foreigners getting in the White House. That's the external authority intruding into the integrity, the formerly intact integrity of, of the mind of the person. A second uh, hallucination that she tells about in her book that I've given a lot of thought to, and this is written up in the, in the paper, Shattered World Psychotic States, you'll read this. It's, it's, a, it's, on, it's online, you can pick it up. Um, she had a vivid hallucination that, uh, I'll, des I'll describe it to you, she describes it in there. She saw in her mind's eye, more real to her and more intense than actual perceptual experiences she was having at the time, a, a, a woman, dressed in an evening gown, wearing long white gloves. It was the dress of the kind of what she speaks of as the artificial, <coughs> the artificial needs and demands of her identity as a child of an Air Force officer, okay? If you read the book, you'll see that's, that's right. Anyway, the figure has blood all over her, though, is one of the problems. But she's also carrying a big tube, this figure in an evening dress. And the tube is filled with blood. And she walks up this figure that she's hallucinating, and lowers the tube into one of the chambers in a centrifuge that is right, a big gray, dark metal centrifuge, <coughs> and then turns it on. So it starts spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning, crushing by the centrifugal force that is generated in the spin, the blood that is in the uh, tube that she's put in there. And it spins faster and faster and faster, and, and, and pretty soon, the anxiety and the intensity skyrockets, and then there's an explosion. The whole centrifuge just blasts apart, and blood fills the sky. That's the end of the hallucination, okay? Now, she gives us that. Kay Jameson gives us that hallucination, and she gives us also the delusion of the snakes coming down and biting people with poison. But she nowhere interprets their meaning. 
here's my understanding of the, of the uh, centrifuge. The, the character in an evening gown and long white gloves, that represents her compliant conformist identity, fitting in with the world of her father and mother, what she needed to do. She says it's all phony and artificial. Well, she was a part of that phony artificial world and conformed to it. When the, bl the, bl the blood is in the tube, that's like her inner vitality. Blood symbolizes the life force. She puts the life force inside the centrifuge and it spins and spins. It crushes it. I see that as a symbol of the crushing power of the dominating control in her family of, of hers. So the explosion is like a manic attack, just bursting out of the constraint, bursting away from the pressure, but it's chaos. And mania is like that. Mania in the extreme is so chaotic, you don't even know what you're doing. You're running a thousand places at once, and it virtually always ends up in a horribly destructive set of consequences. K. Jamison doesn't have any doesn't have any real understanding of herself. She records all of this and gives us a gift to work on. And I taught a whole seminar on her book. And that's the little short pieces of conclusions that I'm giving to you derived from, from hours and hours and hours of study in that seminar. I think when we study, you know, if, if you look at her book and just record it from this medical standpoint, you've got delusions, you have hallucinations, you have all the features of manic episodes and depressive episodes and so on like that. But what's missing from it is a phenomenological understanding of any part of any of it. But it's possible to go back to it and make that. And so K, K is a classic uh, example, phenomenologically considered, of what, what usually is the pattern with the, in the background of so-called manic depressive patients. They tend to come, they're going to be an exception to everything you're going to say, but they tend to come from families that have been massively controlling. They have accepted and complied with the controls that are there, made it a part of their being. They become slaves to the agendas of caregivers in defining who they are and what their behavior should be like. But they rebel, they protest against it in the form of, of an explosion sometimes in mania. So the manic depressive pattern is, ki is kind of phenomenologically understood, has to do with identity, whether one is going to be annihilated and become nothing more than a compliant instrument to fulfill the agendas of others, or are you going to be a person in your own right? And mania is an attempt to be a person in one's own right, but it bursts, it bursts out so violently it can't consolidate itself and get stable, so it falls apart. You're back to depressive, and you have to go back and forth with that. And it's one of the great problems in psychotherapy is how to help manic depressive patients. And I, could, I don't claim I know how to do it. I try. I've tried hard with a number of them, very mixed results. And I think that it's a very important part of psychotherapy research is to devise methods, not exactly methods, but <coughs> approach where you could really reach somebody who has these sharp dichotomous contrasts inside them to help them find a way to integrate those and balance those two. And I talk about that a little bit in Abyss of Madness in the first chapter, and I tell a little bit about my work with a person or two on that. But I, I don't have any illusions that I know how to help a manic depressive person. Most of the people who are carrying that diagnosis that I have tried to help, I, I have not been able to do much with. But the fact that you don't have, I'm not even able to help them may just mean our knowledge hasn't developed yet to the point where we'll be able to do that. So let me see if I'm missing anything here. The illusion of the snake, how do you do this? Another thing about uh, Kay Jamison's book that is interesting, I'm just going to tell you this, and I don't know what it feels like for me just to say these impressions, but Patty Duke's book, A Brilliant Madness, alternates in its chapters, one chapter by a medical authority, one chapter by her, back and forth, back and forth. So you can see in her book, she surrenders to medical authority, she asserts herself. She surrenders to medical authority, she asserts herself, back and forth and back and forth. That's the manic depressive pattern. Self-expression, surrender to authority. Compliance, rebellion, that's, that, that's what it's all about. Kay Jamison's book is not written by some, she doesn't have another person that comes into her book and writes alternate chapters, she wrote the whole thing, on quiet mind. <laughs> However, if you read it carefully, it's amazing because there are two different K. Jameson voices in there. In some parts of the book, she's arguing vehemently for the biological medical interpretation of manic depressive illness. It is genetic, it's chemical, it can be treated only by medication. She's on board completely with all the psychiatrists and so on. In other parts of it, you see she loves her cycling mood states, the, intensive, the passionate intensity. Of her, of her emotional world, and she resists the, uh, 
declarations of the psychiatrist. So the two voices of, of K. Jameson alternate with each other, just like the two authors do in um, 